Hello, Roger. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, so I'm Roger Molina. I'm currently a art science researcher at the University of Texas, Dallas. But I've also, over my career, worked as an astrophysicist for space agencies and as an editor and publisher. Editor and publisher of? Of a series of uh, publications um, under the overall umbrella of the Leonardo uh, nonprofit associations in Paris and, and San Francisco. We work with MIT Press to try and document and promote the work of hybrids whose work crosses between the arts and sciences, arts and technology uh, in a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary sense. What do you think about collaboration between artists and scientists, or what do you think about art-science collaboration? I think it's a very stupid idea, uh, because I think dividing uh, systems of knowledge in, into art versus science uh, is not the right way to think about the problem. Um, C.P. Snow uh, was a family friend of ours, and I think he made a very big mistake in creating this idea in contemporary culture of arts and sciences as separate cultures. In fact, if you look at human history, we've always combined different ways of knowing to try and figure out what's going on in the world. Some of them rely on certain methodologies that we call scientific right now, but astrology was a very successful methodology for many years to study the sky. Um, so I think um, you know, part of the thing is now you know, what are we trying to do? What methods do we use uh, to try and uh, achieve those things? Some of those may be within the artistic or design uh, community. Others may be more in science and engineering or medicine. Depending on what we're trying to do, let's cross those bridges. So this leads me to think about transdisciplinarity. That is something that you are interested in. Right, so um, all ways of knowing end up breaking up the problem into smaller pieces. So in, in the arts, we have ceramics, we have sculpture, we have painting, we have dance. In the sciences, we have physics, we have biology, we have chemistry. In engineering, we have mechanical engineers, and so on and so on. Um, it is very useful to have people who are very expert at very narrow and deep disciplines. If you want to build a huge bridge, you better have very good mechanical engineers and structural engineers uh, if you don't want the bridge to collapse. On the other hand, for some problems, you need to bring people with different uh, ways of knowing, different expertise together. The easiest is interdisciplinary. So astronomers started working with physicists, and out of that came astrophysics. And nobody thought of it at the beginning, but that's what happened. Next is multidisciplinary. If you're a movie producer or stage producer or an architect, you bring together uh, people with different expertise on a common project, building a building, opening an opera. For some problems, um, I think we need to use what are now be becoming uh, known as transdisciplinary techniques, um, which is how you bring those ways of knowing together but structure the interactions in a way where you're going to achieve things in a way that couldn't be done um, without that transdisciplinary approach. Often this means multiple outcomes. Uh, typically in multidisciplinary work, you want to have the opera come out and everybody agrees that's the goal. Uh, in the transdisciplinary collaboration that I'm involved in right now, we intentionally seek to have both scientific and artistic goals at the same time. And the hope is that in that methodology, the art and design methodology will make better science and the science methodology will make more powerful art. So how do you have different outcomes in a transdisciplinary way? Uh, and it's very difficult. Uh, just to finish uh, this interview, um, I like to joke that astronomy is really easy. Astrophysics is even easier, as is space science. Astronomers have had 100,000 years to work together to decide how to name the stars in the sky. We never could agree on the constellations, but it now turns out constellations is not a useful concept in either astronomy or astrophysics anymore. So the fact that we didn't agree didn't matter. In transdisciplinary work, 
we're just beginning. We're in the stone age of transdisciplinary work. We can't even agree on the words we use. We can't even agree on the things in the world that we want to name. Design thinking, what the f does that mean? So yes, um, I, I think we're in the stone age uh, of transdisciplinarity. One of the things that's making this really exciting at the moment is shared tools. And we've always known that shared tools mean shared epistemologies, shared ontologies. Some of the artists I know are better software engineers than some of the scientists I know. They're just native digital inhabitants. They know how to analyze big data, make sense of big data. The artists are better sense makers than the scientists in this, those big databases. So yes, um, transdisciplinarity is sort of a buzzword. I think we need transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, intradisciplinarity. Those are fuzzy things. You may use different modes in a given project at a given time. The final mode may be very disciplinary. You want to market the project and raise money. Well, let me tell you, then let's get our act together and be disciplinary on our marketing. Can I make a couple of other questions? Yes. Um, all easy questions. What do you think about the future of university or maybe if you prefer the future of education? Okay, so um, David Peet, who was a student of the quantum physicist David Bohm, ran a very interesting uh, workshop in a small village on a hilltop in Italy about 20 years ago called The Future of the Academy. And it included a lot of very em em eminent academicians from Italy. And it was a three or four day workshop and the, the basic postulate was let's close all the universities down on the planet down right now, what would we put in, the pl in their place? The last thing we'd put in their place is universities. When universities were invented a thousand years ago, it was really difficult to get access to books. So the university library was essential for new knowledge. Today, who the fuck cares about the university on your campus? We have other ways of sharing knowledge than going to the library. So universities, you know, that part of it was a bad idea. Today, most people do all their learning online. 90% of all learning today is done online. So let's do what we can do online, but let's have places where we get face-to-face, -face, like we are together uh, in Manizales, Colombia today. We're doing workshops. Let me tell you, it is very difficult to do the things that we're doing today and tomorrow face-to-face, -to -face, struggling with things that we don't know really how to teach or how to learn. So let universities really provide that, those locations where you can do things that there's just no way to do online. I don't know what that university will look like. There will be universities in the future. There are universities that are experimenting. Arizona State University comes to mind right now. I, I don't know what they'll look like. But how do we rethink the university and what it does? Another stupid thing about universities. When universities was invented, uh, particularly in the 19th century, uh, when uh, mass education started, the idea of teaching by age group was invented. 10-year-olds take this class, 11-year-olds take 12. When you graduate at 18, you go to university and then you're a freshman. Uh, and so the age cohort was a teaching tool implement. What a stupid idea. Almost nothing that you want to learn depends on your age. There are 37-year-olds in your class here of undergraduates. There are 18-year-olds. They're all struggling to learn. In your case, it's electroacoustics. electroacoustics. Who came up with the stupid idea of 18-year-olds entering college and then 19 and 20? What a stupid. Let's give it up. How do you design advanced education face-to-face -face in a way that gives up? You know, we, you know, we won that battle in the 19th century. Public education became a public good, at least until um, the end of high school in 60% of the places on the planet. But higher education, where you're trying to learn things that are difficult, require broader knowledge. Um, and let me just finish on a really nice anecdote. 
So I recently uh, visited the IBM Almaden labs and I picked up that a word that was circulating about new collar workers. So yeah, you start your career as a blue collar worker, but you're gonna finish as a white collar worker. So how do you get the new collar? So how do universities, independent of your age, of everything else, give you the education you need to become the, the, the white collar worker of the future? And um, one of the things we're doing in Dallas right now is trying to develop a, apprenticeship programs. So just as you used to go to the factory and you'd be an apprentice on how to learn that machine, the lathe, we need that. How do you do that in transdisciplinary collaboration? What are the tools we need? What are the methods we need? How do we train apprentices in those tools with the idea that the university of the future is going to be so different um, that it's really hard to think about it right now? Um, a last question, maybe. Uh, do you have any dream project that you would like to focus on in the next few years? Something that maybe is feasible or not, but something that you are really interested in. Okay, so uh, as you know, Ricardo, um, for whatever set of reasons, uh, when I got to Dallas, I, the group of us uh, started this creative disturbance platform, and the ob objective was to be an intellectual dating service. So many good ideas, inventions, artworks, I mean, you just name it in the history of, of culture, have come about because two or three people met and suddenly did something that none, none of them could do by themselves. For Da Vinci, it was the patronage of the Medicis for a while, and so on. How do you create the equivalent of that for the digital culture? How do you make chance encounters more probable towards a certain social outcome? So one of the things is this creative disturbance and now our Tekka platform, where we'd like to build intellectual dating services. Unfortunately, the dating industry and the sex industry have come up with very bad software to do that. You cannot use dating sex software or sex software for intellectual dating. We've tried it. So how do you do that? As part of that, we need places where those people who meet online can meet face to face. So um, our family home in Paris, we're going to make into an art science Airbnb where we're gonna have people stay there and provoke chance encounters that are like, more likely to result in something interesting. So maybe we could have an Airbnb here in Manizales, one in Paris, one in Montreal, one in Shanghai. So we have the intellectual dating services of Arteca and Creative Disturbance. And then we'd have these Airbnbs across the planet where people who should, and that's an interesting question, meet each other, will meet each other, eat a lot, drink a lot, smoke a lot, and maybe collaborate after that. Thank you so much, Roger. Today is May 3rd, 2018. Thank you. And I hope that by 50 years from now, when Leonardo celebrates its 100th, 100th anniversary, this international dating service will be in place and we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of Leonardo on the moon and we've already started working with the Mexican Space Collective to plan that birthday party on the moon 50 years from now. Thank you so much, Roger.